Our great eternal God in heaven, Father, we come before you this evening. Just thank you that we can utilize the technology to uh, be together and to have this Bible study. We just need more of your knowledge and understanding, especially now that we're in the uh, uh, just before the Passover and the days of unleavened mm -hmm. bread that we can more fully understand it and be encouraged to do what, what uh, we have to do for it. We pray for the connection that it might go well and be with all the people that are listening in that their health might improve and and we can be together uh, in in a few weeks to and we ask this all now in Jesus name amen amen, amen. well thank you very much mr waltner sure do appreciate you doing that And uh, greetings to everybody that's online. I want to thank you all for tuning in tonight. It's good to see all of you. Well, we've, uh, boy, it's been about a, a month or a little over a month now since we've had a Bible study on the book of Acts. And I'm going to go ahead and blame my son for that. That's his fault. But uh, <laughs> sure, I'm glad to see you all. Thank you all for tuning in. Uh, since it's been so long since we had a, one of these Bible studies on the book of Acts, I wanted to just do a very brief review of what we've been over in the, the few months or so since we've been starting on this Bible study. Uh, when we started out, we went through a, a basic overview of the book of Acts. We started off, we talked about this day of Pentecost as it was recorded in Acts chapter 1 and 2. And we saw how the first century church of God began, and, and they had basic tenets of their faith. And those are things that we, in the church of God today, we believe we are still doing those same things. Uh, we covered some of the major issues being faced by the first century church of God as well. And we saw how, well, those same issues that were being faced by the church uh, 2,000 years ago, they're still being faced by the church today. Uh, we, we talked about how there were really two extremes. You have, on one hand, unlimited grace. On the other hand, very strict law-keeping. And these are at opposite ends of the spectrum, but in actuality, neither one is what God desires of his people, because God desires that right choices would be made by free will. Uh, as the historical narrative moved along, we began to see how the New Testament church despite its prolific growth, because remember, all of a sudden there were thousands and thousands of people, 5,000 people added to the church, and that was presumably men, and so if you take into account the women and potentially children added to that, we're talking 10, 12,000 people in the church of God in the first century, and as they began to grow, well, they also started coming under great persecution from the Jews and the Roman authorities. Now, in addition, we, we came in, uh, into contact with this guy named Barnabas, and we started to see that, well, the brethren weren't just undergoing persecution and trials from outside the church. They were also experiencing some issues arising from within the church itself. And there were some people demonstrating greed, people demonstrating a desire to uh, elevate themselves in the eyes of other people. Now, it's it's never good when those things happen. We, we aren't happy. But on some level, it can be comforting to know that we're not alone when we experience trials, when we experience conflict within the church of God. And we know all these things, they, they arise because we are imperfect human beings. We come from different walks of life, different backgrounds, different circumstances, but God has called us all to measure up to the same standard of Jesus Christ. But what we have seen, and what we continue to see, is that carnal thinking leads to carnal division. 
Now, Jesus Christ, he learned obedience by the things he suffered. And by the same token, we learn obedience by the things we suffer. And sometimes we do end up suffering conflict. But when it comes down, down to it, when it comes to confusion, when it comes to conflict, we have to recognize that conflict does not go away on its own. You have to employ long suffering. You have to employ patience, grace, mercy, and you have to push through conflict to get to the other side and have unity. Because if you don't, if you're not willing to push through and you allow a root of bitterness to take root, to take hold, it ends up producing a bad attitude. And, and we can't quit. We can't give up. We have to stick it out. And so we'll see another conflict arise in tonight's study as we continue along in this book of Acts. Um, last time we had this uh, Bible study, we finished up chapter five, and we talked about this phrase, well, what does it mean to obey God rather than men? We talked about some key issues, some key rather ideas that are just central to having a correct understanding of who God is and how he works with people. One of those key understandings is in Acts 5.32, and Peter explained that God does not simply give his spirit to everybody who professes to love him. He doesn't give his spirit to people just because they are a good person or because they have a lot of emotions or because they desire a relationship. God gives his spirit to those who obey him. We also had a chance to look at and be introduced to this guy, Gamaliel. We found out who he was, heard some of his wise counsel, and were introduced to some of the people in his story. Now, despite Gamaliel's advice, the, the apostles, they were still beaten as a warning. And uh, we wrapped up the, the book of uh, the chapter five with just spending a few minutes going through some discussion questions about trials. Uh, so for anybody who missed the last Bible study or who wants other recordings, we also have some, Mr. Scorseth has done some uh, topical studies as well as some um, character studies on Timothy and, and others. Uh, just let either Mr. Scorseth or myself know and we can send you the links. So uh, tonight we are going to undertake the ambitious task of covering all of chapter six. And it's only 15 verses, but there is, as you are about to see, a lot of material there. Yes, my friends, we are going to learn about deacons, deaconesses. We're going to be introduced to this guy named Stephen and some of his friends, some of his peers. So let's grab our Bibles. Let's begin in Acts chapter 6, verse 1, and we'll start going through the chapter. Acts 6, verse 1. Now in those days, when the number of the disciples was multiplying, there arose a complaint against the Hebrews by the Hellenists because their widows were neglected in the daily distribution. So again, the focus shifts from external events that are impacting the church, persecutions, outside troubles, now to internal events that are impacting the church. Now remember who the Hellenists were. We talked about this last time. The Hellenists were Jews who had adopted aspects of the Greek culture. Now, this did not necessarily mean that they had adopted the pagan elements. It could just be that they spoke Greek, or maybe they had adopted some uh, household elements of Greek culture. Uh, this daily distribution, well, what exactly is that? What was that? I looked at William Barclay's commentary. <clears throat> Mr. Barclay says that in the synagogue, there was a routine custom. So every Friday morning, early in the morning, in the first century, uh, two collectors would go around the markets, go around the private houses, and they would make a collection for the needy. Now, this collection would be part goods, uh, bread, grain, beans, other things, and it would be part finance, part money. Uh, then they would distribute those goods early in the afternoon. So those who were temporarily in need, let's say you just fell on hard times this week or this month, well, those who fell into temporary need, they would receive enough to enable them to carry on. Those who were permanently unable to support themselves, because remember, first century, there was no disability, there was no social security, there were no government programs in those days. 
So someone who was permanently unable to support themselves in the, in the synagogue there, they would receive enough for 14 meals. So two meals a day for the next week. Now, it is clear the Christian church had adopted this custom. But when we look at the Jews, there were a little bit of a rift going on. So in the Christian church, we have two different types of Jews. We have the, the Jerusalem and the Palestinian Jews, these ones who, who spoke Aramaic, the language descended from their ancestral language. These Jerusalem and Palestinian Jews prided themselves that there was no foreign element in their lives. They were pure. And then you have these other Jews from foreign countries. Uh, they're called the diaspora. These Jews had come up for Pentecost, and they made this wonderful discovery about Jesus Christ. And many of these Jews of the diaspora, they'd been away from Palestine for generations. We're not talking five or ten years. We're talking 20, 30 years, 50 years, whole generations. And they had forgotten their Hebrew or never even been taught it, and most of them spoke only Greek. So these Aramaic-speaking Jews, they looked down on the foreign Jews. This contempt affected the daily distribution of alms. And the Hellenists, the, the Greek-speaking Jews, were complaining that the widows, their widows, were being neglected. And so, again, unfortunately, we see the beginning of Acts chapter 6 is very similar to the beginning of Acts chapter 5. We see conflict from within the church. And it just goes to show us conflict is an ongoing issue faced by God's church. And conflict even occurs amongst people who have God's spirit working with them or in them. Let's go on to uh, verse 2 now. Then the twelve, talking about the apostles here, summoned the multitude of the disciples and said, It is not desirable that we should leave the word of God and serve tables. As I was preparing for this study, I consulted some other translations. The New Living Translation reads it this way, and it's kind of amusing. It says, so the 12 called a meeting of all the believers. They said, we apostles should spend our time teaching the word of God, not running a food program. <laughs> so we have a number of things that we could note here. Within the early first century church, we have an example of how important decisions were made. The 12 apostles, they would receive the disputes, receive the complaints, receive the concerns, and then somehow they would come to a consensus among themselves, and they would communicate their decision to the multitude of the disciples. Now, why do I bring this up? This is a foundational principle of how we operate today within the church, the United Church of God. We do not operate as a democracy. We don't yield to mob justice. But on the other hand, we also don't cast lots to reach a decision. We covered earlier in the book of Acts, Acts 1 verse 26. That's the last record of casting lots being used in the Bible. Now, God doesn't explain exactly how lots were to be cast. But it is my belief, and this could just be my belief, but it's my belief that he has a good reason for doing that. Now, can or could God work through casting lots? Yes, and he did. But consider this. Casting lots hinders spiritual growth. In fact, this is partly the same problem that the early New Testament church was facing. So remember, uh, these two basic problems that were being faced by the first century church of God. Number one, these Jewish legalists who wanted people to continue to observe the Mosaic Covenant. They wanted people to continue to observe the Old Covenant laws. But then, number two, the other problem was these Gnostics were coming in. And they professed the idea, well, hey, you're saved by grace. You could do anything you want because nothing physical matters. But these are two opposite extremes. And they're both incorrect. Well, why? With, with the Jewish mindset, the idea was, if we do every part of the law perfectly, we will be pleasing to God and we will get eternal life. Therefore, my decisions don't matter outside of the law, because the only thing that matters is what the law tells me to do or not do. Law keeping removes my accountability. 
as long as I keep it perfectly, I'm not accountable for anything else. Now, with the Gnostic mindset, the idea was the exact opposite. There are no laws. Therefore, I can do anything I want. It doesn't matter what decisions I make because I have been given grace and the grace removes my accountability. So bringing it back to casting lots, the reason why casting lots handicaps spiritual growth is because we humans would use it as a crutch to make decisions for us because that would absolve us from accountability. But that isn't what God wants. God desires us to use human reasoning coupled with biblical principles to reach wise and sound decisions. God wants to see the condition of our hearts when we make decisions because his goal is, develop, is to develop in us holy, righteous character, not just a blind adherence to rules. Now, moreover, God has established a structure of authority within the New Testament church for the purpose of doing things decently and in order. Now, this is why in the church today, we attempt to imitate this method of reaching consensus within the ministry. And we're going to see this a little bit more in detail over the next couple of verses. Now, it is not that it is some sort of great power being in the ministry to lord it over the membership, but because it is an extremely weighty, high calling that God has instituted, and because the spiritual health of the church of God is at stake, God will hold every minister of Jesus Christ highly accountable for their decisions. And the authority to make certain decisions is not given to everybody. That was a lesson that was learned the hard way by Korah and 253 others back in Numbers chapter 16. Now, notice as well in verse 2 here of Acts 6, it does not say that it isn't desirable to serve tables but that the apostles could not, as spiritual leaders under Christ's direction, neglect the spiritual care of the brethren for the sake of ensuring the numerous physical needs were being met. Now, do we have an example? Well, yes, we do. We have one from Jesus Christ. So let's look at that. If you'll just hold your place and turn back to Luke chapter 10. Back in Luke, back in the book of Luke chapter 10, and we'll read verses 38 through 42. Luke chapter 10, verse 38. Now it happened as they went that he, Jesus Christ, entered a certain village, and a certain woman named Martha welcomed him into her house. And she had a sister called Mary, who also sat at Jesus' feet and heard his word. But Martha was distracted with much serving, and she approached him and said, Lord, do you not care that my sister has left me to serve alone? Therefore, tell her to help me. Jesus answered and said to her, Martha, Martha, you are worried and troubled about many things. But one thing is needed, and Mary has chosen that good part, which will not be taken away from her. So what was Christ saying here? Was he saying, well, you're worrying unnecessarily? Was he saying, this physical stuff doesn't matter. Why do you even care? Well, no. Listen to what Adam Clark's commentary, commentary suggests. They, they say that Christ was implying, Martha, while you are busily employed in providing the portion of perishing food for perishing bodies, Mary has chosen the spiritual portion, which endures forever, and which shall not be taken away from her. Martha she was well employed, right? She was staying busy. She was serving physical needs. But Mary, by contrast, was better employed. Mary was better employed. Now, there's a commentary, the Precept Austin commentary. They quote that uh, Satan uses many methods to hinder the work of the Lord. Acts chapter 6 through 8 contain three illustrations of how he does his evil work through people and circumstances. So you should see on my screen now uh, three ways that hate Satan hinders the work of the church. I'll read through these for those of you on the phone hookup. But number one, Satan creates dissension within the church. Uh, in Acts 6 verse 1, it says, 
In those days, when the number of the disciples was multiplying, there arose a complaint against the Hebrews by the Hellenists. So, dissension within the church. When a church becomes known for its bickering and backbiting, its effect within the community is damaged and its impact is diminished. Number two, this commentary says the enemy attempts to divert ministers, I'm talking about Satan, from their main purpose of preaching the gospel. Now, in this account, the apostles were feeling pressured to leave the word of God and serve tables. Satan employs the tactic of getting the spiritual leaders of the church so involved, so wrapped up with caring for physical needs, that they have a reduced amount of time available for prayer and for study of the word of God. Number three, in every age, Satan seeks to destroy God's people. In Acts 7 and 8, we read that Stephen was martyred. And if you reference Acts 8 verse 3, it says, Saul made havoc of the church. The commentary concludes, we need to be aware of Satan tactic, Satan's tactics. We need to be on guard against his tactics. We don't want to be a cause of dissension and or diversion within the church. Now, let's go on to verse 3. Therefore, brethren, seek out from among you seven men of good reputation, full of the Holy Spirit and wisdom, whom we may appoint over this business. So here we have entering the role of deacon and deaconess. And two things we see here. Uh, we see in this verse that, well, there are prerequisites. And we also see that there is a process of selection. So uh, out of this entire Bible study, this is probably the section that's going to take up the most time. Uh, there's a lot of details to cover here. So we'll just begin by covering some of the prerequisites, because there are prerequisites for consideration or qualities for consideration for someone to serve in this role of deacon or deaconess. Nobody is perfect. Nobody will ever perfectly exude all of the qualities of a deacon or deaconess, but they should all be present to some degree if a person is being considered for this role. Now, uh, back in verse 2, the Greek word used for serve is diakoneo. Diakoneo, D-I-A-K-O-N-E-O, diakoneo, and it means to be an attendant or to act as a deacon. Now, we don't have a lot of prerequisites listed right here, but in another section of scripture, the Apostle Paul uh, delineates just what is expected of those who are selected or those who are appointed to serve as a deacon. Uh, so maybe you could just join me over in the book of First Timothy, chapter 3. First Timothy, chapter 3. We'll read verses 8 through 13. And what I'd like to do, I'd just like to read through these verses, and then we'll go back to the beginning, and I'll, I'll make a comment about some of these different words, uh, these different characteristics that Paul says are expected of a deacon or deaconess. So 1 Timothy chapter 3, verse 8. Likewise, deacons must be reverent, not double-tongued, not given to much wine, not greedy for money, holding the mystery of the faith with a pure conscience. But let these also first be tested, then let them be serve as deacons, being found blameless. Likewise, their wives must be reverent, not slanderers, temperate, faithful in all things. Let deacons be the husbands of one wife, ruling their children and their own homes well. For those who have served well as deacons obtain for themselves a good standing, and great boldness in the faith which is in Christ Jesus. So the first word we have here in 1 Timothy chapter 3, verse 8 is Paul says, must be reverent, must be reverent. In Greek, the word is semnos, S-E-M-N-O-S. -E and if you have a King James or the authorized. King James, it would say grave, 
must a deacon must be grave. That's grave in the sense of being honorable and well thought of. Albert Burns' commentary says, this man should be free from frivolity and fickleness. Now, this is not to say that he should be stern or severe, but that he should be a serious and sober-minded man who maintains proper dignity and self-respect, one who inspires others. Next characteristic is not double-tongued, and the word in Greek for double-tongued is dilagos, D-I-L-O-G-O-S, dilagos, and it means having two manners of speaking. Uh, in other words, acting one way around church people and, and acting a little bit differently around friends or family. John Gill's commentary says, the deacons should not be those whose hearts and tongues don't agree together, and who, being a sort of middle person between the pastor and members of the church, say one thing to one and another thing to another person. Albert Barnes adds to this, he says, this word delagos occurs nowhere else in the New Testament, and it literally means that a person should be speaking the same thing twice. These should be men who can be relied on for the exact truth of what they say and the exact fulfillment of their promises. The next phrase, pretty, pretty self-evident, says not given to much wine, meaning not a drunkard. <laughs> They're known for acting in a manner that is consistent with reverence. Not given, not not greedy for money. Also fairly self-evident, but this qualification was given. Of course, all Christians shouldn't be greedy, but this was given for a specific reason. Remember in the first century Church of God how uh, one of the roles of a deacon was to go around and take up this collection. So if you're a deacon, you're going around collecting beans and, and uh, fruit and grains, and you're collecting money. Well, it kind of defeats the purpose of their role if they're taking half of that money and stuffing it in their pocket. So <laughs> it takes away from the care of the poor. That's why that is included here. And then Paul uses this interesting phrase. He says, holding the mystery of the faith with a pure conscience. A reference for you, Mark 4, verse 11, where Jesus said to his disciples, to you it has been given to know the mystery of the kingdom of God. What mystery? Join me in Colossians chapter 1, verse 26. To you it has been given to know the mystery of the kingdom of God. What mystery is that? If we turn over to Colossians chapter 1, verse 26, we will see. Colossians 1, verse 26. The mystery which has been hidden from ages and from generations, but now has been revealed to his saints. To them God willed to make known what are the riches of the glory of this mystery among the Gentiles. What? Which is Christ in you the hope of glory. So this mystery of the faith is multifaceted. The ancient of days and the word have a plan for mankind. They have a plan to offer eternal life to physical human beings and add them to the God family. This is a mystery to much of mankind. This would be accomplished by the word, willingly submitting himself to the authority of the ancient of days and entering into father and son roles. And I appreciate Mr. Scorseth's midweek pastor's message where he brought out Philippians chapter two, verses five through eight. And he talks about how Jesus Christ, he didn't submit himself out of obligation. He submitted himself willingly because he and the father determined they made a plan that he would be willing to do that and would be willing to die for you and for me. Now, to learn obedience and to fulfill the plan that had been in place since before the foundation of the earth, and these are biblical statements, the word divested himself of eternal life, was manifest in the flesh as Jesus Christ, the Son of God, completely subjecting himself. Now, by exercising 
perfect submission to the Father, Jesus Christ was able to fulfill the need for a perfect sacrifice. And then God in the flesh died to provide justification for any human being who would acknowledge their transgression of God's laws and repent of sin. Now, acknowledging transgression, repenting of it, having faith that we are justified, not by any physical works or created being, but having faith that we are justified by the death of the creator, and then putting that faith into action and allowing it to transform our lives, the result of which is us following God's instructions, that living faith is then imputed to us for righteousness. And we receive the gift of the Holy Spirit to dwell in us, which is a down payment on eternal life. And so this mystery of faith, it is only revealed by God's Spirit as it works with us, it brings us along to give us understanding of spiritual matters. And the mystery is this, how is it that man can become God? That's a mystery. And it has been revealed. So what does it mean to hold the mystery of the faith with a pure conscience? Turn over back to 1 Timothy chapter 4, 1 Timothy chapter 4 and verse 16. Notice what Paul, what Paul says at the end of 1 Timothy chapter 4, verse 16. He says to Timothy, take heed to yourself and to the doctrine. Do whatever you want. That's not in my Bible. He says, take heed to yourself and to the doctrine. Continue in them. For in doing this, you will save both yourself and those who hear you. Don't get off course. That's Paul's warning here. And the warning is to Timothy. And also to, as we look at these different qualifications for someone to serve as a deacon or a deaconess. Be very mindful if you are ordained into a position of leadership, because now you are setting an example for all the other brethren. They're going to look at you. And that's why Paul lists the next qualification in 1 Timothy 3. He says, first, having been uh, tested, then found to be blameless. Uh, deacons are to be evaluated. They are to be observed and approved by the ministers of Jesus Christ, who will be performing the laying on of hands before they are appointed to office. Their character in this approval process is to be without accusation. And that's a comment from Nelson's study Bible. Now, a verse 80 says, likewise, meaning in the same manner, and then he, he talks about these wives. Now, the Greek word for wives is gune, G-U-N-E. And it's such a short word, but it's kind of a broad word in Greek. And sometimes it's a little difficult to translate uh, because it's so broad. This word for wives could mean wives, as in like, Megan is my wife, or it could mean women. It could be talking about uh, female deacons. So either about a wife of a deacon or a woman who's serving as a deaconess. Uh, then he goes on, he says, not slanderers. Uh, the word in Greek there is diabolos, diabolos. And that means a false accuser. But it's a false accuser who attacks the reputation of another by making detracting statements. We're going to see, actually, if you remember this word, underline it in your notes, we're going to see a little bit about this slandering uh, later in Acts chapter 6. Next, he says they should be temperate, and that word uh, nephalios, N-E-P-H-A-L-E-O-S, nephalios, and the Greek word there, it's temperate, but it, it's not simply being temperate or even keeled. The Greek word conveys this idea of being moderate in regard to drinking alcohol, and it implies uh, having an element of sobriety. Now, this is not to say that alcohol is prohibited. What is prohibited is permitting uh, alcohol to cloud one's senses, because that would bring discredit to God. Uh, then <clears throat> verse 12 it talks about husbands of one wife ruling their children and their own house as well. 
And why does he say that? Well, he gives it for the same reason he gave the instruction to the elders back in verse 4. So 1 Timothy 3, verse 4, one who rules his own house well, having his children in submission with all reverence. Why? Why does it matter if your children are in submission to you? Well, verse 5, if a man doesn't know how to rule his own house, how will he take care of the church of God? Good question. <laughs> and so that's the reasoning for that qualification. But what is the result of doing all these things? What is the result of a deacon, a, a person who's going to be a deacon, possessing these qualities? Notice verse 13. 1 Timothy 3.13, those who have served well as deacons obtain for themselves a good standing and great boldness in the faith, which is in Christ Jesus. So good standing. A Holman Study Bible says this refers to the respect and appreciation received from the church by those who are serving the church in this way. And then Paul he chose to use, or God inspired him to use, this word, great boldness. Great boldness. And that's an interesting choice of words. The Greek word for boldness is parisia. Parisia. And P-A-R-R-H-E-S-I-A. -R -R -E parisia conveys an idea of complete confidence of speech. In other words, this is not to say that a deacon will necessarily be a powerful public speaker, but over the course of time, and because they are continuously engaged in serving the needs of the brethren, a deacon, when in conversation with people, a deacon will have no trouble speaking frankly and directly and with complete honesty and conviction about the things they believe to be true regarding their faith. Now, does this seem to fit the bill of the deacons and the deaconesses in our congregations? I think so. I think it is. We have a number of deacons and deaconesses we are blessed with here in, well, northwestern Minnesota, North Dakota, South Dakota, who are not afraid to state plainly what they believe. They know what they believe, and they stick to it. And that boldness of faith is something that will develop and will continue to grow as they continue to serve God's people. Now, are deacons to be only men? Well, it seems as though this scenario in Acts chapter 6 happened, be, happened to have that specific need at that specific time. Later on, and we won't turn there, but you can write down Romans chapter 16, verse 1, Paul mentions a deaconess, Phoebe, that he held in high regard, and he refers to her in Romans 16, 1 as diakonos, diakonos. So these are just some of the prerequisites, uh, but I want to move on and talk a little bit about the process for selection. How do we reach a decision on who is to be a deacon or a deaconess. Let's go back to Acts chapter 6. Let's read verse 3 again. Therefore, brethren, seek out from among you seven men of good reputation, full of the Holy Spirit and wisdom, whom we may obtain, oh, uh, whom, whom we may appoint over this business. So those who were to serve the physical needs of the brethren Notice this, they were not some sort of outsiders that nobody knew about. Uh, they were individuals with good reputations serving within the congregation. These were to be people who allowed themselves to be led by God's spirit. People who demonstrated some level of wisdom in how they conducted themselves. They had a pattern of good works before they were ordained. Now, uh, now the Apostles sought input from the congregation. But let's notice who did the appointing, because this wasn't some sort of popularity contest. This wasn't a democracy. This was a two sided decision. The leadership asked for congregational input, for opinions, and then they made the final decision with God's involvement, as we're going to see. They would, the apostles, the leadership would not ordain somebody that didn't have congregational support. 
Uh, also, they wouldn't ordain somebody who might have congregational support, but might have certain private disqualifying issues that the congregation might not know about. Now, although there are certain qualifications for people to serve as deacons or deaconesses, these, those prerequisites over in 1 Timothy, those are guidelines for any Christian. All the requirements are godly character traits that we should seek to be developing. However, they're just required for people who are going to be serving in those positions. So the question sometimes comes up, well, does every single congregation have to have an ordained deacon or deaconess? No. It is helpful. It is beneficial. But it's not a requirement. Sometimes there's a perceived need, but there simply isn't anybody qualified. Now, should a person be just ordained just because there's a need? Well, no. I'll share with you something that uh, a longtime pastor, Rick Beam, told me early in my ministerial training. Uh, Rick Beam has been ordained into the ministry over 50 years now. He's been around for quite a while. And he said, if you ordain somebody into the role of deacon or deaconess, just because you desire to have somebody in that role, but they don't meet the requirements, you are creating a future problem within the congregation because you're giving that person authority that they are not qualified or prepared to handle. So we are all expected to serve one another within the church. We are all expected to meet needs as we see them arise, regardless of any ordination status. Let's go on Acts 6, verse 4 here. <clears throat> Acts 6, verse 4, the apostles said, but we will give ourselves continually to prayer and to the ministry of the word. So the primary responsibility of an elder is prayer and ministry of the word. In other words, caring for the spiritual needs of those whom God calls. The elders are not prohibited from physical serving, but like we've already seen, that shouldn't detract from doing the work. The reason for the institution of deacons within a church is to ensure that all of the needs, spiritual and physical, are being met in an orderly fashion. Going on in verse 5, and this saying pleased the whole multitude, and they chose Stephen, a man full of faith, and the Holy Spirit, and Philip, Prochorus, Nicanor, Timon, Parmenas, and Nicholas, a proselyte from Antioch, whom they set before the apostles, and when they had prayed, they laid hands on them. So this Philip mentioned here, this is not Philip the apostle, this is Philip the deacon, a separate individual. Uh, later in Acts chapter 21, we'll see he is referred to as an evangelist. Uh, this Philip the deacon, he's also the same one who we are going to see just a couple Bible studies from now in Acts chapter 8, who meets with the Ethiopian eunuch. Now, it says Nicholas was a proselyte. Uh, what is a proselyte? Well, the Jews could associate primarily with two groups of Gentiles. They could associate with God-fearers and proselytes. I have a number of different sources. This is not uh, anything made up. There's a few I'll just list for you. The Jewish Life and Thought Among Greeks and Romans by L. Feldman and M. Reinhold. Uh, the International Standard Bible Encyclopedia from 1986. Also the Bible Verse Study Commentary talk about these different groups of people. So you have a proselytes. Proselytes were God-fearers who had been circumcised and had bound themselves to keeping the entire Mosaic law, and therefore they were allowed to participate in different Jewish ceremonies. A couple quick examples. Well, you have Nicholas here. Then also, uh, I believe the Ethiopian eunuch of Acts chapter 8 was also a proselyte. And we'll get to that when we talk about Acts chapter 8. Besides proselytes, we also have this group of people called God-fearers. God-fearers. Now, another term would be God-worshippers. And this phrase is one that's used to indicate 
Gentiles, these people who were, they were entrenched in paganism, but they came out of paganism and they attached themselves to many different aspects of Judaism, except they didn't become full converts. So they didn't follow the ceremonial laws or washings. They, and they, they didn't get circumcised because if you know anything about the first century, there were a lot of these public baths and men would just go down there naked. And it was a common thing to do. And if you were circumcised, that was very shameful to be seen at these public baths without your foreskin. And so these God fears, well, they feared God, but they, they didn't go the whole way of getting circumcised or doing some of the rituals. But these God fearers were people who believed in and feared the God of the Jews. And they were welcomed and often sat and listened at the synagogues, but they weren't able to participate. Uh, an example of God fearer, that phrase is used of people in crowds. I'll give you a couple references, Acts 13, verse 16, and also Acts 13, verse 26. So God fearer used there. Uh, the term God worshiper is used of Lydia over in Acts chapter 16, verse 14. Uh, and then a few different people, the centurion who, whose servant Christ healed, remember back in Luke chapter 7, verses 1 through 10, uh, I'm of the opinion that that centurion was a God-fearer. And then the Philippian jailer, whether he was or wasn't beforehand in Acts 16, well, he became a God-fearer afterwards. Now, it's, uh, now, we have some of these other people here listed in, in Acts, some of these other people in Acts chapter 6, verse 5. Uh, who were some of these people? Well, we don't know. The Bible doesn't tell us. We have no biblical evidence. However, for the sake of uh, doing some historical digging, there are a few extra big biblical sources that suggest some possibilities. Now, uh, there is some historical evidence, but these are not set in stone. These are some different historians um, surmising based on trace evidence. So this guy Prochorus from Acts 6 verse 5, they think, well, maybe he was a nephew of Stephen. Uh, Nicanor, possibly somebody who also suffered martyrdom around the same time as Stephen in, in similar circumstances. Uh, Timon or Timon, they don't know. Uh, Parmenas, thought to have suffered martyrdom under Trajan around 110 or just around the turn of the century, around the year 100 AD. Uh, but what we see is that, and some of those are brought out by John Gill's commentary, but what we see is that members of the first century Church of God, they were pleased to yield to the direction of those in authority over them. Not because they could shirk their accountability or anything, but because they recognized that well, the apostles weren't acting on their own accord. They weren't acting for self-gratification. They were acting for the benefit of the membership. And the membership presented their suggestions. But it was the apostles who told the congregation the criteria that was required. The apostles then presented the matter before God. And they took action to lay hands on these men, setting them apart for a special office or responsibility. And it's important to note, these men who became deacons, they were not just rubber stamped. The apostles didn't say, well, look at these guys. Well, yeah, you've been coming to Sabbath services. You're, you're breathing. You're alive. You're a male. That's fine. No. <laughs> the apostles, they came before the throne of God to ask for his guidance, his direction, and his blessing. Now, we are not given a specific timeline. But if you look into the Greek in verse 6, it seems to imply that these deacons were ordained after the apostles had taken some time to consider the matter prayerfully with earnest supplication and worship. And lest you think that's just something I'm making up, this is supported by the Apostle Paul's writings. I'll reference for you 1 Timothy 5.22. Paul warned Timothy. He said, don't lay hands on anyone hastily. Talking about when you go to ordain somebody, 
Don't do it in a rush. Make sure you do your homework. Make sure you do your due diligence. Because if you don't, you're going to hurt the brethren, the, the flock that has been given into your care, but you're also going to hurt, well, you're going to make things harder for yourself, but you're also going to hurt the spiritual life of that person you lay hands on hastily. Continuing on in Acts 6, verse 7. Then the word of God spread, and the number of the disciples multiplied greatly in Jerusalem, and a great many of the priests were obedient to the faith. Man, what a short but joyful statement, isn't it? Because the apostles were committed to caring for the spiritual needs of the church, and because these deacons were committed to caring for the physical needs of the church, the word of God was able to spread. Look at the growth. We've got five to 12,000 people, and then now all of a sudden the church grows even more? That's fantastic. Go on in verse 8. And Stephen, full of faith and power, did great signs and wonders among the people. This word for power is dunamis, dunamis, D-U-N-A-M-I-S, and it means force or miraculous power. The implied meaning behind that is uh, a miracle. And then the word he uses for faith is, well, it's a, a short word, pistis, P-I-S-T-I-S, but it has a lot of meaning. Uh, just a very simple definition of pistis would be moral conviction or reliance upon Jesus Christ for salvation. Albert Burns commentary says, full of confidence in God, or trusting entirely to his promises. You know, when, when faith is present, God is able to work through a person to perform great wonders, great signs. God is a God of miracles. And it would behoove us to consider how many more miracles could or would God do in the church of God today if I had more faith? And we can't force God to do anything by our thoughts. But let's notice what Jesus Christ said before his death. Join me over in the book of John, John chapter 14. And we'll, we'll be reading this probably in just a few days. But John chapter 14, notice what Jesus said just before he died. John 14, verse 10. Well, verse 10 through 12. Do you not believe that I am in the Father and the Father in me? The words that I speak to you, I do not speak on my own authority, but the Father who dwells in me does the works. Believe me that I am in the Father and the Father in me, or else believe me for the sake of the work themselves. Most assuredly, notice verse 12, most assuredly I say to you, he who believes in me, the works that I do, he will do also, and greater works than these he will do, because I go to my Father. And we see, in order to work miracles on behalf of God, there is required a certain element of belief. Now, what does that mean? Well, belief is active faith. Take, for example, you have a little child, you're at the pool, you put them up on the edge of the pool, and you say, okay, jump to daddy. Well, if you say, jump, and I'll catch you. Well, if they believe you, they'll jump. If they don't believe that you'll catch them, they won't. Uh, a great example is actually an account in Matthew chapter 14. So let's just turn back, back to Matthew 14. Matthew chapter 14 and Matthew 14, verse 27. Matthew 14 and verse 27. Immediately, Peter spoke to them, saying, Be of good cheer. I'm sorry, Jesus spoke to them, saying, Be of good cheer. It is I. Don't be afraid. Verse 28, Peter answered him and said, Lord, if it is you, command me to come to you on the water. So he said, Come. And when Peter had come down out of the boat, he walked on the water to go to Jesus. But when he saw the wind was boisterous, he was afraid, and beginning to sink, he cried out, saying, Lord, save me. And immediately, verse 31, Jesus stretched out his hand and caught him and said to him, 
Oh, you of little faith. Why did you doubt? Why did you doubt? Doubt is an enemy of faith. Peter was able to walk on the water when he was operating on faith. We won't go there, but you can read through, and many of you probably have Hebrews 11, where we have numerous examples of belief in action or living faith. Back in Acts chapter 6, Acts 6 verse 9, then there arose some from what is called the synagogue of the freedmen, Cyrenians, Alexandrians, those from Cilicia and Asia, disputing with Stephen. And they were not able to resist the wisdom and the spirit by which he spoke. I'm just going to share my screen again. And for those of you who are on the phone hookup, uh, you'll not see this, but um, these uh, different delineations, these different types of people that are mentioned here, I'll just share with you some quotes from my archaeological study Bible. And I have a, a nice map here. It says, uh, freedmen were likely originally captive or enslaved Jews who had been brought to Rome, then liberated and repatriated to Palestine, where they had constructed a synagogue. And so these different freedmen, it talks about Cyrenians. So Cyrene was a chief city in North Africa in Libya. Uh, and one of its population groups was Jewish. So if you're looking at my screen, you'll see Cyrene, uh, the bottom left flag here. And this is North, Northern Africa, more to the right side. Uh, Libya today is the next country west of Egypt. So uh, Cyrene right here. Cyrene is, you know, was kind of a stopover point because it's one third of the way from Alexandria to Carthage. So pretty significant city there. Uh, a lot of slavery went on in this region, a lot of slave trading. Uh, then some of these were from Alexandria, that was the capital of Egypt, and second only to Rome in the entire empire. Uh, two of its five districts were Jewish. So that's the bottom right one here, the bottom right flag, Alexandria. Uh, Cilicia was a Roman province in Southeast Asia Minor next to Syria. And uh, Cilicia is the province where the Apostle Paul or Saul's hometown of Tarsus was located. So you'll see that uh, the top right here. And then Asia. Asia was, well, today we think of it as an entire continent. But in the Bible, it's talking about the Roman province in the western part of Asia Minor, which has Ephesus as its capital. So uh, that's right right here if you're looking at the map. So when people are unable to conquer or confound you on the basis of truth, they will employ the underhanded technique of attacking your character. When you come into conflict with someone, and you are confronting them with the truth, and they can't confound you on the basis of truth, because what you're saying is true and honest and pure, they will undoubtedly employ the underhanded technique of attacking your character. Let's go over and see that in Matthew chapter 5. Matthew chapter 5, verse 11. I just want to look at two scriptures here on this point. Matthew chapter 5 and verse 11. Matthew 5, verse 11 and 12. This is Jesus talking here. And he says, Blessed are you when they revile and persecute you and say all kinds of evil against you falsely for my sake. Rejoice and be exceedingly glad, for great is your reward in heaven. For so they persecuted the prophets who were before you. So not blessed are you when they revile and persecute you for doing wrong, but for being truthful. Jesus warned his disciples would have to endure this, and this is nothing new. Let's turn over now to 1 Peter, 1 Peter chapter 3. 1 Peter chapter 3, verse 16. 
First Peter chapter three, verse 16. having a good conscience that when they defame you as evildoers, those who revile your good conduct in Christ may be ashamed. For it is better if it is the will of God to suffer for doing good than for doing evil. This is the attitude being endured by Stephen. This is the same attitude that was being endured by Daniel when he was verbally abused and thrown into the lion's den. These are the same underhanded tactics people still use in the church today to attack those who are innocent if they are unable to get their way. And it is important to remember when people do this, they're not rejecting those whom God sends. They are rejecting Jesus Christ as head of the church. And this is seen in great detail in the next chapter, in chapter 7. Let's begin to wrap up this study now. Verse 11, Acts 6, verse 11 through 14. Then they secretly induced men to say, we have heard him speak blasphemous words against Moses and God. And they stirred up the people, the elders, the scribes. They came upon him, seized him, and brought him to the council. They also set up false witnesses who said, this man doesn't seek to speak blasphemous words against this holy place and the law. For we have heard him say, this Jesus of Nazareth will destroy this place and change the customs which Moses delivered to us. The Greek word for false in false witnesses is pseudis, pseudis, P-S-E-U-D-E-S, pseudis. Now, if you're pronouncing Greek words, well, if you're pronouncing English words, the P is silent. If you are pronouncing Greek words, the P is pronounced. So it's pseudes, P-S-E-U-D-E-S for false. And that word can also be translated deceitful. Deceitful witnesses. So they may not have been flat out lying, but they were deceiving. A Holman Study Bible says Stephen's supposedly blasphemous words on this occasion were probably similar to his speech in Acts chapter 7, which emphasizes Israel's disobedience and the fulfillment of the old covenant in the ministry of Jesus. This would have aroused resentment among those who revered Moses and rejected Jesus as the Messiah. Finally, end of the chapter, verse 15. And all who sat in the council looking steadfastly at him, saw his face as the face of an angel. Wow, what does that mean? <laughs> well, I would like to just share what a few different commentaries say about this, four different commentaries. Holman says, Stephen's facial expression reflected his innocence and the spirit's role in his life. John Gill's commentary says, there was such calmness and serenity in his face, which demonstrated his innocence. Adam Clark says, well, sayings like this are frequent among Jewish writers who represent God as distinguishing eminent men by causing a glory to shine from their faces. Uh, think of Moses when he came down from the mountain after being in God's presence. Uh, and then Albert Barnes says, this expression is one evidently denoting that Stephen manifested evidence of sincerity, gravity, fearlessness, and confidence in God. This expression is used to denote the impression produced on the countenance, meaning the face, by communion with God. This language is very common in the Jewish writings. So just to wrap up. Uh, so far in the book of Acts, these first few chapters, we have seen many foundational concepts laid out. We've gone through a lot of just, let's call them fundamental beliefs, just the, the bare basics. And we've seen them, Luke kind of fleshing them out in great detail. And we can appreciate seeing many similarities between the early first century New Testament church and the church of God today, particularly we see a continuation of doctrine, and that is so comforting. Now, as we exit chapter 6, and we continue on through the book of Acts, we are going to begin to notice that Luke 
starts talking less about these fundamental beliefs of the church. And Luke starts to focus in more on the historical narrative. Uh, he begins to lay a foundation of truth and explains beliefs, but then Luke shifts his focus to the work that Jesus Christ is accomplishing through his church. So that's, as we go through the rest of the book of Acts, we're going to see less just basic foundational stuff. We're going to start to pick up the pace. We're going to start covering rather than just covering days and weeks and months. We're going to start cooking through years and uh, we'll see the historical narrative really pick up speed. And so uh, there may not be as well, there'll still be a lot to discuss, different background things, but uh, there may not be as much time spent on individual single verses, so many in a row. So next time we'll speed it up a bit and we will cover most, if not all, of Acts chapter 7. <laughs>